Welcome back on the main stage at the We Love Travel powered by ETB Berlin and the Berlin Travel Festival. My name is Leah Jordan and I'm from Tech Talk Travel and I'm honored to be hosting the next panel on this stage. Um, welcome to the Travel Tech Roundtable where established companies in the travel sector meeting startups. We have great minds joining us today for this panel. One person being on site with me, I'm so happy about that, Olga. Thank you so much for joining, Olga Heuser. Very happy to be here. <laughs> yeah, thank you that you are here on stage with me. Olga Heuser is founder and CEO of Dialogue Shift. Dialogue Shift is a Berlin-based startup that offers a guest communications and conversational AI platform, aka chatbot solution and live chat solution. Welcome, Olga, great to have you. Then we see Are we having the other ones with us already? Yes. I'd like to introduce to you as they come into my screen. Hi. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Hi from Berlin. Amazing. For everyone, we start on the bottom right. I don't know if you are in the audience, you're having the same view as I have. Michael Riegel, would you like to lift your hand? Quickly, great, Michael, great to have you here. Michael is uh, founder and CEO of ComTravel, the all-in-one business travel platform, also a Berlin-based startup. Michael, great to have you here, welcome. Thanks a lot uh, for having me. Looking forward to interesting discussions. Amazing. And then everyone, please welcome Sascha Hausmann. Sascha from Barcelona tuning in. Can you hear us, Sascha? Yes. Yep, I can. Hi, hi. Good Amazing. To see you. Great you're with us. Sasha Hausmann is partner at Hauser Partner, a venture capital investment fund focusing on digital businesses in the early stage and also CEO of the Malta based CRS Hotels Busy Rooms. So our round is complete, and as you can see, we are a very diverse group, which is very interesting. Before I dive into that, a short reminder to everyone tuning in live from home, from the offices, wherever you are at right now. Please also check for the Q&A option that you can see right below or besides, depends on what, mobile, uh, what device you're using, to also contribute with your questions. We will make sure to cover them, and I'm seeing them here right in front of me. So please, we're looking forward to have you integrated in our discussion. So, as I said, it's a very interesting mix we're having here with us today. Olga, you're from Dialogue Shift, a recently founded 2018 in Berlin. 19. Start, 19? Yeah. So, oh, 19, actually. Yeah. So, even younger. But we started earlier. You started <laughs> earlier, okay. <laughs> yeah. Founded in 2019, so you're a really fresh newcomer. Startup with six people in the team mm -hmm. here in Berlin. Yeah, that's Dialogue Shift. Then Michael, Comtravo is a startup where we can say it's actually already a rather grown-up one, right? Approximately 130 employees founded. What year we were founded, Michael? 2015. There 2000. are 380 people and uh, founded 2015. Wow, so we're speaking about a already rather, rather much grown up startup. And Sasha, you're from a venture capital fund that invest, is investing currently into 70 investment cases, 31 of them being uh, in the mm -hmm. vertical of travel, the travel industry. So Correct. we're actually looking at a very good diversity in this group. So interesting for all of us, I guess, is to understand the past crisis and ongoing COVID-19, how that impacted all of you differently or maybe not differently, maybe similar. So I'd like to start off with you, Olga. How was it for you and your team, the impact that you felt from the COVID-19 crisis, speaking in terms of working as a team and uh, keeping your business running? Um, yeah, it was a challenge, of course. I guess it was a challenge for everyone um, because in March, Every th everything froze down, like sales, everything was gone. Our onboarding pipeline was frozen, everything was frozen. And of course, we entered a stage of shock. Um, and uh, thank God here in Germany and, and also in other European um, countries, we have um, the possibility of um, short-term labor, Kurzarbeit in German. And of course, we cut our costs um, using that um, in the short term. But, um, but then we thought, hey, we are a startup. We are pretty flexible and agile and creative, and we should turn roadblocks into speed bumps. 
And that's why um, we actually used the crisis to diversify. Um, so we developed a um, healthcare product. It was actually a COVID-19 chatbot um, for a hospital, a big hospital here in Berlin. Um, because we, we thought, hey, the hotlines in March, they ran hot because too many people were asking the same questions all over again. And they were asking questions they couldn't Google. So that's why they called the service hotline of the um, health department or um, of the hospitals. And we thought, hey, but this is what we do, right? So this is, we, we automate communication. So basically our platform is industry agnostic. Um, so we approached Vivantes together with a partner and asked them if they would use a chatbot for that. And um, they um, said yes, and uh, they had a very short decision-making uh, um, process. Um, so within a few days, they said, okay, let's go, let's do this. And we went live after uh, two weeks. And um, uh, after going live, um, the chatbot answered about 1,000 questions per day. Wow, okay. There would be 1,000 five-minute calls. There would so be 83 hours a lot of, of monkey telephone work, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> calls. Um, so we really helped Vivantes, um, the hospital, to relieve their uh, service desk um, and their service hotline. And also to, um, to make the information that people needed, like... Um, about symptoms or about the test centers um, for corona tests. We made this um, information very easily accessible. All right, that's a, that's a great story of pivoting within a crisis and adjusting your services. Um, Michael, Michael Riegel, you uh, with Comtravo, have you observed a change in consumer behavior or in the market demand that resulted in a change in your offer or the services you're offering to your customer base? Um, yes, of course. I mean, we, we absolutely have. I think there's never been a crisis that had a bigger impact on, on the business travel space. Right? Like, um, so I think in the most extreme month, which was April, um, volumes were down to, um, in all of us, down to like 15%. Right? Like, so um, that is crazy. I think the industry has never seen something like that before. Um, I think what we now see is that um, uh, a lot of that, or not a lot of that, but like a certain chunk of that has actually uh, recovered. Um, but with all the new uh, laws coming in right now, I mean, you all followed the media, I guess, um, uh, there's likely going to be more stagnation or um, at least like no, no further recovery for that. And this has huge impact on, on, on the industry, right? And on the industry means A, on the consumer side, it's obviously significantly less people traveling because it doesn't feel safe at this point of time, right? Like, I don't know where to travel, um, what am I allowed to do, and so on. This means that for those people that really need to travel for business, and there is a lot of companies that need to travel for business, they otherwise wouldn't have a business, right? Like we always say, everyone with a tool belt, so to say, hey, like if I can't like install my machine that I'm, I'm selling somewhere, then um, yeah, then I just don't have a business, right? So they still need to travel. But there's a lot of need for consultation, right? Like, so we see a lot more questions popping up, what is safe, where to travel and so on. So I think that's one big change we're seeing. Um, the other one is a lot around transparency, right? Like so. Um, I think knowing where are my travelers, uh, where where have they been over the last two weeks, um, where can they safely travel to, because regulations are constantly changing. So me as like, I don't know, the travel manager of a company or someone in charge, I need to know where, where my people are and need to, to steer accordingly. And I think that's something we, for example, like within the first month of this developed like a world map where you can easily zoom in and, and filter for certain countries, for certain options, for travel dates and so on. And you're always in the end on top of um, where, where you plan and therefore to also manage this. And I think overall, the, the crisis, I think there we are still, still from our perspective, probably early on. Um, and I guess, like, look at the next 12 to nothing, um, there will be massive consolidation uh, happening in this, uh, in this market. I think it has never been the case before. All right. Thank you, Michael. And Sasha. You're an optimist. You say you don't want to discuss the negative parts of all this happening right now. And you're also saying that the economical markets right now are kept alive artificially and that that's the reason why we cannot really talk about a outlook or forecast anything. Could you dip into that deeper? What did you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I don't want to discuss negative anymore because I think we've had six months of panels where everyone was... Um, 
worried about COVID and, and the outcome. And, and I think you know, at some point in time, we got to look forward and make sure that um, that we discuss the future. But what I mean with it's being kept alive artificially is that uh, governments right now provide a lot of support to to companies and to economies. And, and that's the right thing to do because a crisis like that, you know, we haven't seen a crisis like that. And governments need to make sure that, you know, the, the economy doesn't totally die. But what it also does is, is it... Um, it extends the life of companies that probably shouldn't have existed beforehand as well, and it also, you know, extends the life of companies that, uh, you know, even with the financial support, will not be able to survive. And with insolvency, um, you know, having having been paused in, in some of the countries in Germany, for example, um, where you don't have to um, where you don't have to apply. Um, yeah, we'll, we don't know yet what the consequences will be. So once we see Kurzarbeitergeld, uh, furlough and, um, and loans and, um, and access to money go away, uh, we'll finally see how many companies will survive. All right, thank you. And you also said that the crisis, it's in line with what you just said, but the crisis will not only see losers, they will also be winners. And Sasha, if you would paint a picture of the winners of this crisis, how would they look like and what are they doing? But there, there are a couple of them, right? And I think you have to go through multiple areas of, of, of reviewing that. There are those that, uh, like Olga, right, that have gone in and said, okay, good, um, you know, as part of the crisis, um, I came up with a new product. And, um, and that product will also be good after the crisis, not just during the crisis. Um, you have you have those that have enhanced their um, their offering, right? And when you look at most of the technology providers in the hotel technology space, the space that I'm usually at home in, um, you know, there's lots of lots of focus on um, online check-in, which we didn't really worry about for a long period of time. Um, there are products that you know that drive consumer con con convenience. Um, they will you know they will um, check it in. Um, and then you have those companies that um, you know have used the time to finesse to finesse their product because they weren't busy with markets anyway, and they just you know spend the time on on you know taking the customer feedback they had received in the past and never focused on and, and started you know uh, focusing on those. And there's a lot of background noise, by the way. Do you have that as well? Huh? Anyway, so there's. Those, those that will win are those that you know closely monitoring their markets and that are willing to adapt and um, and that's luckily also you know one of the advantages being an investor in startups startups are quite used to that um, you know they are they are used to um, they're used to pivoting they're used to you know adapting to new situations so um, you know I'm hopeful that um, a lot of our portfolio will um, will actually survive simply because you know they've used the crisis to adapt yeah, I think we hope all for that. And uh, yeah, fingers crossed. Um, Michael, from your point of view, if you look at the, if you want to look at the positive sides of the current situation, what would you pinpoint as advantages that you could benefit from as a company looking at the change coming with the current crisis? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm very much aligned there with uh, what Sasha already mentioned um, in a way that I believe if you are smartly steering through a crisis, and, and this always sounds a little bit cheesy, but we fundamentally believe it's true, um, uh, there's always opportunities there, right? Um, and I think in our case, um, the, the most obvious and obviously biggest opportunity um, is uh, that there's heavy, heavy consolidation happening, right? Like I think um, the large majority of players in the market um, are also missing liquidity. Um, it's, it is tough times. So if you haven't been like um, in a stable mode before, um, this is obviously like just getting more difficult. Um, so, so I think this is, this is everything else but easy. And I think this is also opportunities we are seeing, right? Like I think we, we see a stronger trend towards digital products, while at the same time there is a need for, for certain consulting, which is exactly what we are doing, right? Like in the core of what we've been building, we've built it I mean, building software on like an operating platform for business level, but we are also focusing on a certain service layer, right? And I think this combination is extremely powerful, um, especially during these times, but also post crisis. And I think that's for looking at, right? Like when, when in the past it was really costly um, to also acquire potentially new companies um, and 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 grow via that. Um, this is at a completely different level. So as long as you somehow believe in recovery of the market to a certain extent, we don't believe it will fully recover. Um, but that's also not necessary since it's a very big market. Um, but if you believe in, in, in a good extent of recovery, um, then there's huge opportunities of being uh, one of the players with a significantly larger market share post-crisis 
um, than pre-crisis. And I think this is something where, especially we at Comtravo, we think we are well equipped uh, to go through this. Um, and yeah, and I think therefore can, can very much also um, uh, benefit from it. Thank you, Michael. Olga, you also said before, and we had the conversation about this panel, you said the pandemic has accelerated the digitization of the hotel industry. Your background is very much also in the hotel industry. Could you dig into that? Can you give us a concrete example, for example, for us to understand what you mean by how does that show in the operations or yeah, so, um, with the operators? First, um, so what we do is we, um, we provide a chatbot solution for hotels. This is our main product. It, always, it has been our main vertical before the crisis. And uh, we automate uh, the communication between guests and hotels. And also we automate simple processes such as bookings, service mm -hmm. bookings or room bookings. Um, what we see now is that um, we have a higher demand for our product and for guest-facing technology in general All right, um, yeah. than before the pandemic. So hotels are mo more open for um, technology, or the, the adoption is growing from the hotel side, not only from the customer side. And, um, and also hotels, um, they have to, they, they, they are in this situation because they know that we will have to maintain the physical distance between guests and, and the hotel staff, maybe for a longer period of time. So they have to, um, uh, to put, uh, personal interactions or to um, um, yeah, so um, translate, let's say, translate personal interactions into digital interactions. And they will have to do that not only for the pandemic, but also for the time after the pandemic, because guests getting, are getting used to it. Um, and so what we observe right now is that the high touch um, hotel industry is adopting to the low-touch um, economy, where everything is digital, where everything is uh, instant, conveni convenient, and always available. And uh, what we all also see is that um, hotels, of course, they, they, mo many hotels, they um, have to reduce costs. So um, before the crisis, we had some discussions about AI and hospitality and how can you automate communication because it has to be very personal and it has to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Whereas now, hotels are approaching us saying, I don't need your live chat because I don't have people who can answer live chats. I, I need a chatbot who can answer as many questions as possible. So there's a shift in, in mindset. Um, concerning uh, technology in hotels and also AI in hotels, which is uh, very interesting. Yeah, that's actually very interesting. Speaking of digital transformation, Michael, could you observe with your target group as well a heightened readiness to engage with digital solutions? Yeah, I think actually we see both trends. So we see an acceleration in the, in the digital piece. Um, that is, I think I initially mentioned that to a certain extent, this is a lot around transparency, understanding what is going on, getting live updates, getting notifications around things. And I think there's a much, much stronger trend, and especially like our target group is, is um, what we call like German Mittelstand, so companies in the Dach region um, that are often very conservative. Um, and I think they have not been open to go into this a lot in the past. And I think this is definitely changing. There's much more openness um, for this. So I think that's that's clearly accelerating this trend. This is also why we fundamentally believe we are in a very, very good position there. And I think the other trend we see is that um, in times of crisis, um, people care about different things. So um, um, one thing is like there's so much more uncertainty in the market um, that there's more things where I potentially want to talk to a human and ask them for an opinion because you. Like, you can't be up to date with updating, I don't know, your software around these things. Like, at the moment, literally, like, every day, there's rules changing around where can you stay, where can't you stay, and so on. So providing as much information as possible uh, via our platform is one thing. But then also being there, if um, now I'm at the airport, can I enter, can't I enter, and so on. So we see a lot more demand um, in that as well. So it's actually, it's funny enough, but it's um, it's changing on, on both ends. So on the one hand, there's actually... Uh, more, more demand for consultation. And then on the other end, there's a stronger um, trend toward digitalization. I think the one interesting thing we also observed is that um, even within the digital real, there is, um, uh, there, 
the demand is changing to the extent that, um, to give you one example, for like before crisis, the most demanded additional topic was around compensation of carbon dioxide. So really, like people and, and, and companies heavily cared around the environment, right? And, and therefore, we also built a product where you can easily compensate um, all the carbon dioxide you, you in the end produce or compare and so on. Um, now, different the crisis, um, this is not a topic at all anymore. <laughs> so you see that literally like, companies are going back to, to basics. They want to be safe. They want to understand where are their travelers. Um, and and they, they, yeah, they, they just focus on this piece, right? And I think that's, that's crazy in how fast like, the, the focus and the importance of certain things um, um, changed. And I think, therefore, it's, it's absolutely crucial to be able to adapt uh, very fast, which is, isn't it? Yeah, it's an advantage if you are a, um, a younger company and, and potentially slightly more, more agile. Even, yeah, uh, even, I think, even though we are not, not the smallest anymore, but like, um, I think we can still move very fast there. You just mentioned something that I find very, very interesting, and I want to ask Sasha about this because you have insights in so many company structures and teams, and also you know a lot about background around established companies. When we talk about being able to adjust quickly and pivoting, when something happens, being able to adapt to change. What would you say is that one thing that, for example, an established company can learn from the startup scene? And if so, is there any some more points you would add to that list that an established company can learn and benefit from? There's, yeah, there, there are a couple of differences between established companies and, um, and uh, startups. So number one is, is established companies are often not run by founders anymore. They're run by hired management. And, you know, and higher management isn't isn't a bad thing, but um, higher management isn't the founder that's, you know, that's in the business trying to make changes every day. Startups are used to, every startup in our portfolio has gone through tough times. Right? And tough times means they're running out of cash. And this is, a, this is a constant for startups. And startups are used to the fact that they are very quick they have to make drastic changes in order to to survive and in order to go through a cash crunch. Right? So, you know, when COVID hit, um, Almost everyone in our portfolio was in the first three days was on the phone with us and on the phone with you know with governments and you know trying to figure out how to save costs and how to you know how to reduce burn rate in order to you know foresee this for a very long period of time and they didn't think that that was a natural thing for them to do and I'm also you know through my own software company involved with more traditional players and um, I had a few on the phone in March and April that said you know, I'm just going to wait it out and I'm going to sit around and I'm just going to, it's going to go away at some point in time. Right? And they had to make those changes in May and June um, and finding out that it was very painful because a lot of the cash reserve that they had built over years was already gone. And then also, and, and Michael is somewhat, you know, also mentioned that it's, there's, there's a difference of a six people team like Olga has and a several thousand people team that some of those you know, more established organizations have today. Um, even if management is very innovative, and as some of those you know, traditional players you now see very innovative management as management is getting younger. But um, until such time that they've been through all the different departments and all the different layers within the organization that are required to change the ship, to change the course of the ship, um, you know, several weeks or months have passed already. So. You know, the agileness in terms of being able to make those quick decisions, even if they want to be made, is often not there simply because there is an organization that has to follow. And that's very difficult, um, you know, when the, you, you've been working in the same environment, the same procedures for such a long time. All right. Thank you. And that kind of also points in the direction of a question we just received from the audience. Thank you very much for that. I read it out and then I just uh, opened the floor to it. Are the startups the big winners of the crisis because they are more flexible or digital, or are they a new, or are they new startups, or are the new startups the biggest losers because they will find it hard to get funding for their business model? Who wants to take on that question? I think it's a, it's a mixture of answers on that, and um, because when you look at when you look at uh, startups, not every startup will have the advantage of, um, of um, you know, of benefiting from this because they, they were able to pivot. I think you will see that traditional companies will benefit from it. I mean, one, you know, some companies that have benefited from the crisis are those that are producing toilet paper. I, I really kick myself that don't invest into product because, you know, I should have really invested into toilet paper. Um, but, um, you know, you, you would see that every single component of an industry will have a winner and it will have its losers. I, I wouldn't go as far as saying, you know, the startups are all winners. I think you will have you will have quite a few winners in the startup scene. And I think they'll probably manage better because of the, you know, the ability to adjust quickly. 
But um, you will have traditional players that also will benefit from the crisis. Olga, what do you think about that? Yeah, I would say it depends. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's just as uh, Sasha just said, you can't say startups are winners or losers. You will always have um, the more flexible startups who are, who put, the, let's say it like this, they put themselves in the situation where they can take opportunities. Um, you can have a small team which is creative and flexible, but they cannot handle crisis because they are, you know, they, they, they get in a shock and they don't know what to do. But then there are, on the other hand, teams, and it, they can also be bigger teams, that put themselves in the right position and they have the mindset of, okay, let's just do it. Let's just uh, test it out. Let's, let's try. Um, so I would say it depends on the organization itself. Mm -hmm. um, on the culture in the organization, and of course, it depends on um, the founders or the management team, depending on who is, uh, who is the leader. Very good point. Michael, what's your take on that? Yeah. Maybe, maybe one, one comment up front. So, um, Sasha, I'm not sure if that uh, toilet paper investment would have been a good one, because the overall consumption of toilet paper has not changed that much. So, no, that again, but has, this is, I think, just, a good... Um, it was more profitable yeah. due to the yeah. fact it was sold to consumers. <laughs> exactly, that's the point. So and that's that's exactly the point I want to make, and it's the same with the other one. So it really depends on um, how you as a company are positioned right now. And I think there's not so much a difference between um, established companies and startups in that sense. But um, we see established companies that are very well positioned in this crisis and will, will, will highly profit from it in the end. And there are startups doing the, the same thing. And I think there's, there's probably various factors that uh, pay in on this. One is obviously the execution around the crisis. So how well are you equipped with your team? How quickly can you adapt and so on? That's one component. I think there's other components, which is to a certain extent, it's also also luck. Like what is your exact business model, right? Like um, can, you, can you actually profit from it or can't you profit from it? Um, I think the other one is obviously like how well did you do in the past? So do you have liquidity reserves and so on? Because you might have the best business model in the world if like suddenly a crisis hit you and uh, you don't have liquidity, then this is also a uh, tough time. So it, I think it heavily depends, right? Like, um, I don't know, we, for example, would have been in a much more difficult situation if we, um, if we hadn't raised around end of last year and can now like preserve our cash and can plan very, very long term, right? And this obviously makes it easier to steer through a crisis versus um, if you just plan to take an additional funding, right? So I think there's a lot of components, and it's it's def like it's way too tough to say um, startups will do better or established companies. But I think one thing that becomes clear across all companies is that companies that struggled already before that um, they are the first ones leaving the market, um, and I think that's the, I think that's the the common denominator there. Yeah. But they would have gone anyway, and they would have, you know, they would have dis disappeared anyway. So the crisis kept them alive for a bit longer, but they'll they'll die afterwards. There's one important component that, that you just said that I think I'd like to pick up on, and that is, um, you know, there's going to be a lot of impact is going to be on the fact whether you still had funding prior to Corona. I would fully agree with that. But when I look in our portfolio, the ones that have closed rounds prior to COVID or shortly prior to COVID um, it have reduced burn, and so um, they don't have to raise for another, you know, 12 months or so. And they will they will encounter probably markets that are easier for funding than right now because anyone that needs to go for funding right now, it's it's tough. I mean, funding rounds are happening but um, they're not as quick as, as, as they used to be prior to COVID. And valuations have adjusted. Sasha, I have a question from you coming in from the audience. Thank you again very much for that. I'll read it out to you. Sasha, mm -hmm. do you think that VCs investing in travel startups need their money to keep their existing investments alive? Or will they be able to invest in new travel startups in the coming months? Depends on the stage of the fund. Um, when you um, look at us, uh, we're currently raising fund four. Fund three is uh, fully allocated, so we're supporting portfolio. Um, and we are doing a little bit of new investments, but not as much as usual. Right? Um, the funds that we talk to that do invest in travel, um, you find a mixed, um, a you find mixed feedback. Some of them are very scared. Um, because they are unsure um, and um, they want to support existing. They don't really want to get into something new. And then you have the others, and I count to that. I mean, if my fund four would be closed, I'd be making lots of travel investments right now because um, right now we get 
that presented good deals at good prices. So you have those that are that are keen to explore further simply because uh, it's it's a good market right now. When you find that markets are not willing to fund, um, you get better deals. So I think there's there's a good mixture. Generally, um, the venture capital market is doing investments. Um, they're not as uh, hungover as I thought. I was expecting that a lot of our uh, co-investors would be hungover and they wouldn't really want to do lots of activity. But um, there's still a good amount of activity. We're still seeing quite a good amount of leads coming in on a, on a daily basis. All right. Thank you. Then, Olga, I have another question for you. Um, looking at the current situation and the months ahead, how do you prepare yourself and your team to come out of this crisis in a stable and sustainable manner? Well, um, we are a bootstrapped startup, so it, it, it's, let's say self-funded startup, and uh, we are independent, so we don't have uh, venture capital uh, or no venture funding. So um, this means we, from the beginning, we wanted to have a business which is sustainable and which is as much as fast as profitable as possible. Um, so um, this is why, um, of course, you were in a shock because so in March, April, when the pandemic hit because they didn't know, okay, can we keep our runway? Because we, are, we very much depend on new leads and new customers in order to grow um, and in order to, to keep the organization or the business alive. Um, so the good thing is uh, we made some good strategic decisions. Um, one was the diversification into the vertical of healthcare. Right. Um, the other um, decisions were uh, technical partnerships with other companies. And now we are- As in a, for example, like integrations? Like, or? Yes, like right. to order for example. It's right. um, um, a guest, uh, guest app, a digital guest app, or um, Apaleo, we're integrating with Apaleo, the PMS, or Muse, but, but we had that already before the crisis. Um, so um, we are in a position right now where we have enough leads coming in. Then we have enterprise customers coming from healthcare, which is very good for us because they have higher budgets. They just have more money. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Everyone listen well. <laughs> That's the budget. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, we, so we prepared before the crisis and then we made some good decisions during the crisis and I think now we are in a quite good position. That sounds good. I hope. I'm, I'm happy to hear. So on a scala from 1 to 10, where would you rank yourself in terms of uh, feeling confident to be there oh, also it's next 10. year? It's, it's definitely 10. 10. People, yes. did you hear that? It's a 10. <laughs> Michael, your, your company is at a quite a size already, but naturally it... You, you're going for more growth. How do you maintain growth and how, do your, how does your strategy, as far as you can share that with us, look like for the next months and the year to come? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's obviously also something we have heavily discussed and, um, and I think we feel very comfortable with the strategy we've chosen there. I think in terms of when you usually, like we spend um, a good amount of money also on marketing to acquire new leads and get in new companies. I think that we have reduced. And what we'll see is that we are talking to um, a lot of um, also typical business travel agencies out there, right? Like a lot of the companies I mentioned before that also like struggle more with liquidity and so on. And we see um, opportunities for either taking on part of their business, partnering and so on. Um, but that is basically a new way for us um, to, uh, to also grow, right? And, and we've done this a few times now over the past months already and, and we're continuing to do this. Uh, but this basically allows us to uh, to get a customer base that um, is, is potentially significantly bigger um, than um, than what we had before. So I think that's one of the big strategic changes. Um, I think the other one is a lot around target group. I mean, what we saw, what helped us during the crisis in order not to be too much revenues is is our specific target group. So um, I think I mentioned it before, but we had a a lot of like typical companies from like the Dach region that are Mittelstand, right? And they are often manufacturing something, producing something and so on. And these are often companies that heavily depend on travel, right? Like other example would be logistics companies, right? Like they are more busy than ever um, in, in these times. Um, and I think that's what we are also doubling down on. So we are heavily focusing on, on, on these target groups um, because no matter what, what or how long the crisis in the end is going, um, they will still continue to travel, right? Like obviously safely and caring about it. Um, but so we are working with a lot of them and I'm actually also getting getting um, quite a few new ones um, from this category, so to say, on board. So I think that is probably the two biggest um, 
things on on um, how we adapted. And I think with this strategy, like there's that's huge room for for growing over the next year, right? Like um, I think that's yeah, the, uh, yeah. Honest answer is there. I think opportunities have never been bigger for us than than um, in, in the coming phase now and and already over the last few months. Wow, that's good to hear. Like I'm happy to hear that. And um, I want to also dig deeper into a topic that is your area, Michael. And Sasha, I think you have an opinion on that as well, a very strong one. Um, you read a lot about business travel is dead, business travel is not going no, to recover, yeah. say goodbye to business travel, refocus, leisure is the new one to look at. Um, whoever you wants to start and give us your take on that. Maybe we take Sasha because Michael just answered the question, then we take Michael. Sasha. Yeah, I mean, uh, 21 years in travel, I get to hear every every little bit of a cough. I get to hear travel is going to die and, um, and we're going to change the way we travel and consumers are really worried and concerned. And I was beaten up in March and April when I said, look, guys, I think you're all full of it because the minute that borders open, people will travel and um, and see what happened. People traveled. They traveled so much that we can now argue we have the second wave because they did travel too much. Um, and the same with business travel. And what the industry, and especially the expert that I talk to, keep on forgetting is that travel is not just about the travel industry. There are There is travel outside the travel industry experts. And that's the companies that uh, Michael has just mentioned. Right? There's construction, there's manufacturing, there's logistics. Um, and those companies will need to continue to travel. And they make up a good portion of the business travel component. Right. So it's not just service companies and not Googles and Facebooks and and Amazons and, and such of the world that um, you know that send their staff home and don't want them to travel. There are other sectors that, that need to travel, where travel is part of making money. And um, and that's just not going to go away. So therefore, to say you know, business travel is going to die, I think that's just overstated entirely. That's from people that don't understand really very much what business travel is all composed of. Very clear, clear statement. Michael, what's your take on that, since that's your main target group as well? Yeah. I mean, we're obviously like hearing that question quite a lot, and, and we also have a strong opinion on this. I mean, everything that Sasha said, I would fully agree on. Um, I think if we think about like why should business travel die or why should volumes go down, then um, I think the, the main reason is like obviously business travel has to be safe, right? I think that needs to be a given. Um, but it is something that is, I think, solvable. It's just a question of time, right? Like there will be testing, there will be uh, people will be more careful and so on. So I think that's that's the one big thing that will be solved. So it's a question of time when that piece will recover. And I think then the only other argument I hear why um, potentially business travel is, is uh, not going to be that big anymore is a lot around like, hey, we can save costs or save money if we replace actual and also time if we replace actual in-person meetings, the video calls, right? And that definitely is the case. I think there is a, a bunch or a subset of work-related tasks or topics um, that uh, can be replaced by, by video calls. I think especially, for example, if I deal with existing client base, right? Like if I know my clients there and we do, I don't know, every half a year we do a check-in, then maybe it's not necessary that I, I travel to Munich to, to meet a client there, um, but we can just do a check-in via, via Zoom or Hangouts or, or Teams, right? I think that's, um, that's definitely like a, a piece of the pie that could be replaced by, by video. Um, but then there's so, so, and, the, and I think that's the large majority of things that cannot be replaced by video, which is, um, like when we acquire big new companies, um, we have to be there in person. I think that's that's something companies require because there's a big trust factor in that, negotiating um, with companies and so on. So I think all types of new businesses um, or acquiring new business, and that's also what we hear in the market, um, is something that just works so much better um, in person. So I think that's, that's a big big piece of the pie that cannot be replaced. All, like, all the other industries that Sasha mentioned cannot be replaced. So I think... There's, there's not so many segments that we actually believe um, that will go away once travel is, um, is somehow safe again, right? And I think there we, we read a lot of research and I think that's something where by now we are, we are very much convinced um, that, uh, yeah, there will be certain, and then we assume maybe it's going to be roughly 80% of what is, what is left, maybe 85, maybe 75, but in that range, right? And, um, and there we are, we are actually pretty certain that uh, that, that is, uh, we're not too off the bad estimate. Yeah, that sounds like a big enough cake for all of us still. 
Um, and there's opportunity here, right? We talked about um, we talked about opportunity um, in those parks. I mean, you know, with things that Michael just said in terms of you know, um, you know, self safety, health and safety. I mean, those measures have always been there. But if they increase, that also means there need to be solutions for it. We have a startup in the portfolio that used to deal with business visas. Business visas are not the big thing right now, so they enhance the product by also providing Corona tests to, um, to companies, right? So that people can travel safely. And there, there are many more. Um, opportunities that come alongside with um, business travel is slightly changing. This is a very good example. Actually, we had a question before as well from the audience. They asked for concrete examples of startups that actually respond very well with their service to the conditions of the current crisis. And you did that with pivoting with the chatbot for the um, ho hospitals. You, Sasha, just mentioned an example. Is there another one we could add to that list? A startup that responds very well to the a new arisen need or in a heightened need due to the crisis? Um, and toilet the portfolio paper? That's, yeah, <laughs> no, <laughs> no. no toilet paper in the portfolio. Um, in, in, in the portfolio, that's probably the one that has you know, taken the opportunity and used the pandemic to, um, to, you know, to adjust to it the most. I mean, all of them have made little tweaks and adjustments. Um, uh, but um, not to a degree that they went from doing business visas into providing corona tests. I think that's a, a huge, a huge, it isn't really a pivot. I mean, they're going to go back to business visas as soon as business visas are required, but that's probably the most extreme that I can come up with. But most of the travel ones have adapted to some degree. All right. Uh, thank not as drastic, but they've made adjustments to, to their business model. All right. And we just touched on the human factor when we talked about the business travel sector, right? And t speaking of the human factor, one of your statements is also when we talk about going back to the operations of a hotel, for example, speaking of automa automa automatization and implementing systems, there's a fear with certain people that we replace people by systems and by machines and robots. And is that so? Do we, do we face a future with hotels with no employees and no teams and only chatbots and systems in place? Oh yeah, we already have these hotels. <laughs> I mean, we already have hotels without staff. So um, I think yes, to a certain degree, you will see more hotels um, with less staff or without staff at all. But on the other hand, I guess we will also see hotel brands that really focus very well on the human touch after the pandemic, because this is something that is very unique for hospitality, right? And I guess um, the challenge here or the sweet spot would be to find the balance between the digital convenience you can give your guests, and they do expect it, um, and on the other hand, to provide this very unique personal um, experience um, that uh, it also individual experience that they guests can have in a hotel. But yeah, I mean, the thing is with implementation of um, artificial intelligence or with um, software that automates processes or in our case, um, communication, um, the thing is, the AI usually does not um, does not take like it, you cannot replace a human with a chatbot. It's just not possible because a human is a human. But what you can do is you can replace the chatbot in your human with a chatbot. So when a receptionist is answering the same questions all over again every day, you can. You can reduce, or you can take this work and, and give it to a robot, or in this case, a chatbot, and the employee is freed up and can and has more time to focus on on tasks that are more important, that are more relevant, and maybe it's it's the personal conversation he or she can have in the hotel um, with a hotel guest. So I think the implementation of in AI or um, automating um, software is, um, is you have to see it um, with the perspective of adding something to your human workforce, something that helps the human workforce. Right, thank you. We have about five minutes left, and I'd like to ask um, the round for each of you to give us a rec like a advice you would share with fellow startup founders or people thinking about founding a company. What would be your advice for the current time? What to keep in mind? What I would keep in mind is this: that um, 
that Corona, and you know, I hate to say this now because I'm too optimistic to really accept it, but it looks like that we will have disruption for a little bit longer than we originally thought. Right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't just yet, um, you know, bring business back to normal because I think we'll have another couple of weeks of, you know, of disturbance. But at the same time, I would carefully start planning investments for after the crisis so that you're prepared when, um, when we're finally being able to travel again. All right. Carefully planning investments. Michael, what would be your advice to a fellow startup representative? Yeah. Um, I think it's not that different from Sasha. So I would, I would phrase it probably slightly different in a sense that I would say, like, uh, don't, yourself, don't let yourself get down from, like, the current crisis. This is a big look out for opportunities, right? And and there's like for any business there is opportunities there, and just spend spend like really hard thinking on that, like really think it through. Um, and if you come up with the I think the right strategy, no matter how bad your position is at the moment, like you definitely have uh, good chances of of uh, winning post crisis. And I think that's what you should spend time on now. Thank you, Michael. Olga, what's your yeah, advice? My advice is pretty simple: turn roadblocks into speed bumps. All right. <laughs> That's a great closing statement. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you to the great panelists for joining me here today. Thank you for tuning in remotely, Sasha and Michael. And thank you, Olga, for coming in. It was great having you here. Thank you to the audience for tuning in and being with us, for providing your questions. It was, uh, we enjoyed it a lot. And I'd say that's a wrap. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leah. Thank you very much. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Leah. Thank you. That's Just a wrap. Hi. To you. It's so good to meet you. Good to see you. So good to see Congratulations. you. Congratulations. David Ruetz, head of ITB Berlin. So, Lea, it's almost a wrap. What is your highlight of the day? Tell me. The highlight of the day is uh, my adrenaline. My feeling is going high. It's very personal, but that's actually just a little reunion of people from the industry and the travel industry is a family, so that just feels amazing. And another highlight is that this is a great benchmark, benchmark for the entire industry. You clearly showed with this concept and this format that we can do this, also hybrid and virtually, and we can bring emotions across, we can share knowledge, and we can be one industry learning from each other. So that's my personal statement for this event today. Mr. Ruetz, I pass on the question to you, of course. Do you have a highlight? Well, I have a resume and I have a highlight. I'll tell you the highlight after, but my resume first is, uh, obviously it's possible to merge hybrid and, and physical uh, with this great setup that we've had here, with a great team that we've had here to help all of us. I regret that some of the panelists couldn't come due to their employers who wouldn't let them travel or due to other circumstances. But the media interest was gigantic. So thank you to all the colleagues of the media who were so kind to join us uh, online. And that is my resume. But if you want to hear my highlight. Yes, please. I love my, highlights. My, my, waiting for <laughs> my wife called me because she was watching the live stream and she said, what is that animal beneath the table? Is that one? Yes. <laughs> yeah, and she said, can you, yes. Yes. can you bring it home? So it is my highlight. All right. <laughs> Are you, is, is he allowed to take it home? Another I don't know. No, it's no, no. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. So a resume and a highlight, of course, but also looking into 2021. And of course, the question about the ITB 2021. How would you answer that? And how, which perspective do you have when we look a little bit further? Before looking further, I want to look back because since in inception or ideation in 1966, ID ITB's mission has always been and will always be to bring people together so they could share knowledge about travel and tourism and so that they could do business in a responsible way. And this is our mission and it won't change whether it be hybrid or digital or physical, it won't, our mission won't change. And I cannot say what happens in March of 2021. We saw it last week here when circumstances changed. So we will stay true to our mission and bring people together in whatever form. Thank you so much.
Thank you for wrapping up the day with us. And coming from the studio to the, to the big stage, I can say, wow, what a beautiful day, right? It we was, talked yes. a lot. We had so many different experts, deep dives, inspirational panels. I definitely had um, beautiful destinations coming into the studio. So my wanderlust heart really, really is really happy and satisfied. And of course, I learned that we shouldn't be afraid of changes. We shouldn't be afraid of vulnerability. We should rather embrace it. That yes. is my take home And we message. all should work together on rebuilding the trust for the end consumer, because that's the one that's uncertain. And there is actually no reason to be uncertain with us in the industry, because we're the professionals. We know how to do this. And we've proven that today here with this event. But also, if you look at all the hotels and operators, they know what they're doing. And they're working on this on a daily basis. So that's what we have to do, rebuilding the trust. I hope we don't go back to the normal as we go back to the new normal so that we, we, we maintain learnings from this, from this crisis, yes. because there will be other challenges in the, in the next decade to come. We don't know what it is, but I hope we, we don't just fall back into old habits, mm -hmm. but stay sustainable in a way and, 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 and stay tuned. And I hope Finnair will stop selling business class food in their supermarkets. Yeah, you mentioned that this morning. <laughs> it made me uh, smile. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. you. Thank you. It's time to close the day. And thanks again to all the partners. So thanks to the content partners, the German Online Travel Association, and of course, to the media partner, the VF. W and Tech Talk Travel. Thanks to a huge team here in the audience. This is the audience, the huge team which made all this magic on stage, but also, of course, here in the live studio possible. So this applause goes to all of you. Thank you so much. Cheers to this first day. And as I quote from the World Tourism Organization, travel, enjoy, respect. Together we can change the world, stay healthy. All the best for you. And this movie now, this movie is for you. <laughs>